Baptist Church and friends. I'd like to welcome you back to this week's Sunday School lesson out of Romans chapter number 3. It's the gospel of grace for the world. And so we remember last week we've been, last couple of weeks we've been looking and as we said that it kind of breaks down in first chapter 1 it starts looking at the heathen. Chapter 2 it moves on into looking at the hypocrite and then the Hebrew goes on up into the first few eight, eight verses of chapter 3 continuing to look at the Hebrew and then the last part of chapter 3 looks at humanity in general. Uh, so, but, but, so we'll be picking up looking at the Hebrew in this lesson, but before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, just want to thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for this day you allowed us to live. Thank you for, just for this Christmas season in which we remember the Savior coming, being born there in Bethlehem to live a sinless life and to bring about plan of salvation, your plan of salvation, that we could all be saved. As we look in this lesson, we see it's all and through by Jesus Christ and His righteousness that we are saved. And pray just be with each object of prayer. Pray for families of lost loved ones. Pray for, again, for all those affected by storms that hit last weekend. And pray for, especially for the lost, you convict them and save them. Just lead God and direct in all things. Just now pray. Amen. So picking up again here in chapter number 3 of Romans at verse number one, it says, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is their circumcision? So as we finished up last week, the last few verses were talking about, you know, circumcision and how it you know, was, wasn't, the un, wasn't circumcision in the flesh that made a difference, but it was circumcision of the heart. And that's spiritual circumcision. That's what really makes a difference. So what we see here is that, you see, Paul says the question, and again, he was, did this kind of in, in chapter 2 a lot, kind of asking questions and kind of giving the answers to him. says, you know, what advantage hath the Jew have? And, or what profit is circumcision? And, you know, he, it, in, so he answers that in verse 2 and says, it, much every way, chiefly because it, unto them were committed the oracles of God. So he says, yeah, it was important. It, you know, the Jew does have an advantage. The Jew does have, a pro, there is a profit to circumcision as far as, identify them as a unique people, as God's chosen people, but as far as when it comes to salvation, there really is no advantage. But it says they, they did have the oracles of God committed to them. So as God's chosen people, God did deliver the law of Moses, to Moses there to them at Mount Sinai. He spoke directly to them in Mount Sinai as we just recently studied in the book of Exodus. And so we see that the Jews did have something that they could look to, but the trouble was, what had happened is they had become dependent upon that good standing, thinking they had a good standing with God based on the fact that they were a Jew, their nationality, based on, based on the fact that they were given the oracles of God, and based on the fact that they had circumcision. So they were trusting in those things rather than actually having true faith in God. And so there was the problem. And what that Paul was trying to point out here, that it's not who you are, how, what family you're born into, and we can kind of apply, or you know, you know, what rites or rituals you go through, or you know, you'll say, you know, we can kind of apply that same thing, thinking about those who might grow up to save parents in a, in a fundamental New Testament church that believes the truth of the Word of God. You know, you may think, hey, I'm okay because I, you know, my parents are saved. I've grown up in this church. I've spent my entire life. I've known, I've known about Jesus my entire life. But still, in that person's life, they, they have a great advantage in that they have grown up under that and know that. But likewise, they still are responsible, you know, just, you know, their parents' beliefs, their grandparents' beliefs and faith in Jesus Christ is not enough to save the next generation. Each generation has to put that faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and be saved. It says in verse 3, it says, For what if some did not believe, shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? So he asks the question, says, If some do not believe, well, does that make God's faith in effect? Does it mean that faith in God is of no effect because some don't believe? Absolutely not. He says in verse 4, it says, God forbid. Absolutely. Just because some choose not to believe does not nullify the fact that others can choose to believe and do and will trust in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, goes on in verse 4 and says, Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou, hast, that thou might be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome, then, overcome when thou art judged. So it says, 
Here he quotes here and it says, let God be true and every man a liar. This is a quote from the Psalms. He says, so every, you know, God is true and every man is a liar. Everything that man touches is a disaster. It's, it, it, you know, man is just prone to lie. Man learns to lie. You know, little babies learn to lie at a young age. They learn that, you know, they, when they really don't really need anything, that they can cry, they can pitch a little fit, and they can get some attention. And so kids learn at a very young age how to lie. And it says, but, you know, God's true, but yet man's a liar. And it says, you know, and by that you, you might be justified in thy sayings and might overcome thou and judge. So it ultimately has to be, you know, you know we have to kind of practice what we preach, I guess you might say, because you can, you know, really ruin your testimony, as Brother Parker was talking about Wednesday night, you know, you can really ruin your testimony quite easily, you know, especially when you try to serve the world and serve God, you know, you can't be successful in doing both. It says in verse number 5, But if our righteousness commend the right unrighteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. So basically God's going, you know, Paul's going out to here and he's kind of trying to counter a situation here where people are trying to say that he's preaching a gospel that, you know, you can, you know, that, you know, committing sin actually increases the grace of God and the mercy of God. And so he's trying to refute that down through here, and that's, that's kind of down through verse number from 8. And this whole exchange goes back, so let's go ahead and read on down through 5 and 6, through 8, and kind of touch on it together. God forbid, you know, again, he says, you know, if our unrighteous behavior commends or increases the righteousness of God, that would make God unrighteous. And he said that, again, God forbid, that's not possible. That's not going to happen. That, you know, you know God not, does not take pleasant in unrighteousness, pleasant pleasure in unrighteousness, and therefore he would be an unrighteous God if he allowed, you know, allowed unrighteousness to, to continue. So, because for then how shall God judge the world in verse 6, you know? How can he judge the world? How can a righteous God, if an unrighteous God couldn't, would be a worthless God? He couldn't judge the world. He couldn't decide what's sin and what's not sin. It says in verse 7, For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? So if, he says, and he kind of uses the argument to say, if, if God's truth abounds through my lie, through my sin, through sinful behavior, then why am I judged as a sinner? And it doesn't make no sense that, you know, that they would be saying that, you know, Paul's teaching this ideal. As it says in verse 8, it says, Not rather, as we be slanderously reported, as some affirm we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. He says, you, you're, you're, there's some accusing me of saying that, you know, let us do evil that good may, may come, and, or that good may abound, that God's grace and mercy would abound even more. And that's a ludicrous kind of thinking. I mean, you know, why would you think that Paul would have such an ideology or would say such a thing? And, and it, it's just not true. And so we see here that uh, in verse number 9 says, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have there before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are under sin. So if you go back into the previous chapters, you, he said, you know, is, you know, because the Jew has an advantage, because the Jews were given the oracle of God, because they have circumcision, because they were God's chosen people, do, you know, do they really have an advantage? Are they better than the Gentiles or, or you know, the Jews? You know, is there any distinction? And he says, no. There's really nothing there. You know, they're both are both are guilty. Both are under sin. And so, as he goes down through the rest of the chapter, he's going to emphasize the fact that all humanity is has a sin nature and is is under the curse of sin. And so, these next few verses down through here, he starts he's quoting several scriptures out of the Old Testament to prove his point. It says in verse ten, as it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. Stop quoting out of the Psalms. Nobody's righteous. No one's righteous. Uh, the Bible tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's only through and by His righteousness that we have any righteousness. So our human righteousness, what we can muster up in ourselves, there's none of us righteous. It says in verse number 11, it says, There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Nobody in their fleshly, you know, no fl person in their flesh can truly understand the things of God. It takes spiritual discernment. It takes the indwelling Holy Spirit to help you to understand the Word of God and to understand the things of God. And therefore, because you do not understand the things of God, by nature, you're not going to seek the things of God. And so we see that, you know, again, just showing the sinful, depraved nature of man. 
Verse 12 says, They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. So he says, Everybody's gone out of the way. They're all unprofitable. They're all just, you know, they're, again, none doeth good, no, not one. Nobody does good. You know, if, if, if you know, and I'm not saying that people are not capable of doing acts that are considered good by mankind, but in the eyes of God, ultimately, the best act that a man can muster up and the best positive things that a man can do pale in comparison to God's standards. You know, again, you know, people want to think they can out, put more good in one side of a balance and outweigh the bad on the other side of the balance. And well, at what point do you outweigh the? Is there enough good to outweigh the bad? And you know, what if you start doing more bad things and start tipping the balance the other way? It, it would it would be an unending battle to try to to tip that balance in your favor. And that it's just it's it's all in in. in effort and hard, you know, trying to do works and things that, you know, are not going to achieve righteousness. It says in verse 13, he kind of changes from talking about, you know, nobody is good to going to some specific things about why people are not good. He says, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. So he says, their throat's like an open grave, a sepulcher being a grave. So what's in a grave? Dead bodies, corruption. So that's what's coming out of their throat and coming out of their mouth, and it's a constant lying and deceit. Again, you know, God be true and every man a liar. And so we see here that you know their throats an open sepulchre, constantly deceit. Jesus told them, said, and, you know, told them, said back there that you know you're what you know, out of the abundance of your hearts what comes out. You know, you, you're speaking what comes out of your heart. And, you know, and says what doesn't. What, that's not what defiles you that you take into your body, but it's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you because that's what's issuing out from your heart. And again, you know, James emphasizes the fact over in the book of James how, that, how wicked the tongue is and how evil it is and, so, and how much trouble it can cause. And so the throat being an open sepulcher, it's just full of corruption and deceit and just and, you know, filth coming out of there. It says, says it goes on in verse 13, says, the last part says, The poison of asp is under their lips. I mean, how much damage can be done with what we say? You know, how we should be so careful about how we choose our words, you know, because it can be just like venom to others. You know, the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is the furthest thing from the truth. I mean, that just shows you man's wisdom. Yeah, sticks and stones can break your bones, and if you choose not to let words hurt you, in your mind, I guess they don't, but ultimately, what others say about you can really just, you know, destroy your testimony. People can spread false information about you and can totally destroy a testimony that you have. And so you've got to be careful that you don't give them any fuel or to do that. And, you know, just people will choose to try to destroy you and, and, and destroy it. You know, just like the venom of a snake would destroy your life. It says in verse 14, "...whose mouth is full of cursings and bitterness." I mean, isn't that the typical person out here in the world that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ? And if you're truly saved, there shouldn't be cursing and bitterness coming out of your mouth. But, you know, it's a definitely harm to your testimony if you're found cursing and, and doing that all the time. So, I mean, it's important that, you know, pureness, pure things, are, we choose our words carefully. You choose pure words, and, you know, I'm sure we've all been around it working on a job and stuff, the person that just every, every, they can't say anything without using some kind of curse word. And it just shows you just the depravity of man. That, you know, and you see TV shows and everything else. It's, it's this constant barrage of just using bad language. And I don't know what people think about using those curse words all the time, especially, you know, some of the ones that, you know, you know, some I can tolerate better than others. There's other, you know, and that's just the f fact of being around it kind of makes us numb to it. But, you know, there's just certain times, especially like somebody constantly using the Lord's name in vain, that just, it just irritates me, you know, because they obviously don't have any concept of really what they're doing. It says in verse, kind of changes from what they say to, to their actions on, down through here, starting in verse 15, it says their feet are swift to shed blood. I mean, look at it. I mean, just think about what's going on in our world today. They're doing these smash and grab robberies, going in groups of people going into businesses and smashing and things and, and stealing stuff and running out. And, you know, getting that same stuff happened back during the BLM protests and stuff. And, you know, people just have no regard for anybody else. And, you know, again, people getting just constantly out for their own selves. And just, you know, you know don't worry about 
killing, you know, don't worry about shedding blood or harming others. It says destruction or misery in their ways. Everything that mankind touches begins destruction and misery. You know, mankind is, you know, look through our history, wars and just constant wars and battles and fights and it's everybody just trying to tear at each other, you know, Right now we got turmoil, Russia threatening to go into Ukraine, China threatening to take back to take Taiwan. And it's just it's constantly just destruction, misery. That's all that we see in the world. You know, and it's and it's just the chaos. That's that's what mankind is. That's why humanity is in the condition it is and why we need a savior, why we need the Lord Jesus Christ to redeem us from our sins. It says in verse 17, In the way of peace have they not known. Again, talking about the fighting and the, and the end going. They don't know peace. They don't understand peace. They don't, they don't desire peace. The only true peace can be known in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. And then ultimately he says in verse 18, There is no fear of God before their eyes. They have no fear of God, no respect for God. Proverbs tells us that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. And it's, that's what we need in order to have true, you know, a reverent fear of God, and people don't have that reverent fear of God. And that's the reason people just disdain the things of God and reject the things of God, and, and again, while we're in the mess we're in. It says in verse 19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth shall be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. And it goes back to saying, you know, what the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Let's think about modern times. If you the, there, There's laws concerning speed limits. If you're going down, the speed limit sign says it's 55 miles an hour, you're under that law. You're to abide by that and not exceed 55 miles an hour. If you go over 55 miles an hour and a cop pulls you over, you're guilty. It, you're under that penalty at law. You broke the law because you're under the influence at law. If you've got a valid driver's license, you've agreed to say, I'm going to obey the laws of the road. And one of those things is the speed limit. And so you have no argument. You can't make an argument. When that cop pulls you over and says you're going 65 and a 55, all you can say is, hey, I'm guilty because you knew better than to do that and you got caught. It says, and likewise, when it comes to the things of God, where if you're under the law, and all mankind is, and that's what he's trying to establish here, just because the Jews were given the law specifically doesn't mean that Every, everybody else is exempt from that or that the Jews have some special privilege because of that because ultimately God is the creator of all mankind and thus we are, should have a reverence and respect to him. And you know, basically it says that all the world is guilty for God. Everybody's guilty for God. You know, nobody is exempt. It says in verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law is not going to justify you. There's no amount of keeping the law that's going to be able to justify you. No, the flesh is incapable of keeping the law. You just start looking at the Ten Commandments, which is just a small part of the law, and start examining your life and see how many of those you failed at. I'm sure we've all lied, which is bearing false witness. You know, we've, if you've done anything you know, to, to steal... You know, we'd say, well, I haven't stole something from a store, but like I pointed out before, if you work on a job and you're supposed to work, you know, eight hours a day and you only work seven hours a day because you take an extra ten minutes at your break and your lunch and so on and so forth, and you've cheated your boss out of time and out of work. And so, you know, you can, you can steal in other ways rather than actually taking something physical. It says, you know, and it says, and the key here in verse 20 is, for the law, by the law is the knowledge of sin. So it's through the law that we have a knowledge of sin. Without this law, we would have no knowledge of our sinful behavior and what is sinful. It says in verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, and all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So he says, now it's it, the law is a manifest God of you know now righteousness is man, of God is manifested by the law with, without the law because it says because being witnessed by the law and the prophets God the witnesses and the prophets and they they foretold of how true righteousness can be achieved it wasn't by the law wasn't by trying to keep the law and so 
it was through and by the righteousness of God, which is in faith by Jesus Christ. It's through and by Jesus Christ. That's how we can attain true righteousness, not by trying to fulfill the law, because if you tried to fulfill the law, there is absolutely, again, I say you can't even keep the Ten Commandments, much less keep all the other spirit, all the other, you know, social and 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 religious aspects to the law that that was given to Moses. Much less, you know, keep those basic moral laws in the Ten Commandments. You know, if you think about that rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, you know, what can I do to turn? What must I do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus said, you know, you know, talk, mentioned like the last six commandments, and and Jesus, he said, well, I've done those for my youth, but he said, you just tell him, well, go sell all you got and follow me. Well, see, he then revealed that he wasn't willing to worship God. And God only, because he was ultimately worshiping his riches and, and trusting in his riches. And so he failed in observing the first four commandments that had to do with his relationship with God. And so it just shows you how it, you know, it's impossible to, to keep the law. And it says, and it, again, he says in the last part 22, it's, and, it's, and all upon all men that believe, for there's no difference. No difference. It says in 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jew, Gentile, Black, white, red, Asian, African, American, you know, Hispanic, European. It doesn't matter where you're from, what nationality you are. You're all, we are all guilty under the law. We're all, we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. We all need a Savior, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. As verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we're freely by His grace, it's His God's riches of Christ's extent that we have that redemption that is in Jesus Christ. And He is the only source of redemption. It says in verse 25, Whom God hath sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare the righteousness for, declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And so righteousness... You know, that's, you know, a right standing before God. And, you know, again, that's the theme of this book. And so it's manifested here. It's revealed through and by Jesus Christ. And we're freely justified. And justified means is just as if you've never sinned. And so it's, it's revealed freely. So it's a free gift. It's by His grace. It's, you know, it's God's unmerited favor. It's... And it's set forth, the, the redemption through Jesus Christ, and it's set forth is that God set Jesus forth as our perpetuation. He is that substitution. He is the one that takes upon us, to, upon him. And, you know, and a perpetua perpetuation speaks of a covering, or, you know, and it's a divine work. So he's covered our sins. He's, he's taken his precious blood, and our sins are covered to not be seen by God anymore. And so and then in that way he declares his righteousness that for the remission sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Thank you, thankful for God's forbearance and his mercy because he could easily just strike us down for our, our unrighteousness. But God's forbearance and mercy gives us, usually gives, gives many opportunity after opportunity to make things right and to become a child of God and, and trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Verse 26 says, Declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier him which believeth in Jesus. And Jesus sent, God sent Jesus to be that perpetuation, and to, to declare and to say, his, declare his righteousness, that he could be the, the just one who could then justify those of us who would believe in him. But the key thing is, you've got to believe. Though, you know, John 3 over there it talks about, in I think verse 18, about how you know, you're. Those who don't believe are condemned already because of their unbelief. It says in verse 27, then where, it says, Where is boasting then? Is it excluded? By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the work of the faith. So he says, you know, where's boasting then? You know, can you boast because... He says it's totally excluded. There's no room for boasting. Ephesians tells us, you know, not by works of... of Righteousness that we could do, you know, it tells us, you know, it, you know, not, you know, salvation doesn't come by works, but it's by grace that you're saved, you know, lest any man should boast. And so we see here that it, there's no room for boasting. It's not by law, it's not by works, but it's simply by the law of faith, and that's the faith of trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, there are 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. 
man is only source of justification. His only source of, is by faith and not by the deeds of the law, without the deeds of the law. The, deeds of the purpose of the law is to reveal to us our need of Savior. Again, back in verse 20, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Galatians 3 and 24 talks about how the law is our schoolmaster to point us to Christ. And that's how we know that we're a wretched lost sinner that needs to be saved. It says in verse 29, Is he the God of the Jews only? Is, not, is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. So it says, you know, it does, you know, it says, you know, is, you know, is he's God only of the Jews? No, he's also the God of the Gentiles. Because God created every man. You know, God, Jew and Gentile. It's only because God chose to bless Abraham and Abraham's seed and to make them a chosen people for him that the Jews even exist. There would be no such thing as Jews if God wouldn't have done that. But that doesn't give them a special Play, it gives them a special place. It's kind of hard to explain. It gives them a special place in as far as earthly blessings go. But when it comes to spiritual things, it only actually puts a greater burden on them because they should have a knowledge of the spiritual things and therefore should be more readily willing to accept what God has given through the Lord Jesus Christ rather than reject it than a Gentile would. And so, again, kind of like if you grow up in a New Testament church with by saved parents, saved grandparents, etc., etc., you, you have a, it's a kind of a greater responsibility, you know, to not trust in your heritage, but to actually, you know, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that trips a lot of people up to grow up in church. And while you, a lot of times, you'll see those that, you know, make a profession sometime early in age as myself and as I did at a younger age, and it, you know, just because I thought that's what I was supposed to do, and it was later, a few years later, that the Lord actually convicted me and showed me I was lost, and I was able to trust in Him as Savior. It says, and and so He says, you know, seeing there's there is just one God there in verse thirty, and He justifies those that are under circumcision and those who are in uncircumcision by the same way. It's through and by faith. Verse thirty says, do we then make void the law through faith? By our faith, is the law made void? He says, no, God forbid. And you'll see that has been repeated repeatedly through this chapter, and it's repeated several times throughout the remainder of this book, Romans. It says, rather, he says, yea, we establish the law. The law, without the law, you would not know that you need to put faith in Lord Jesus Christ. You would not know that you need a Savior. It's by and through the law that we're... It's revealed to us that we are in need of a Savior, that we need the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives, and therefore we should, you know, cling to the law, treasure the law. It's not a means by which we can be saved, but keeping it because we cannot keep it. But ultimately, it is, you know, that thing that, again, verse 20, it's by the law that knowledge of sin is brought about. Again, Galatians 2, 3 and 24. It is our schoolmaster. It's what points us to the fact that we need a Savior. We need the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. And therefore, we, it establishes that law. It doesn't nullify the law because it's by that law that we have that moral standard by which we can see our shortcomings. And see that, as it says back there in verse number 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's through and by the law that is revealed. And we should be thankful for the law that it does that revealing task and shows us that we need to be saved, shows us that we're lost and undone without the Lord Jesus Christ and we need to trust in Him as Savior. Again, uh, just go on in. And so with that kind of covers, you know, looking at humanity as a whole here, Paul does. And then he kind of next week in lesson chapter, in chapter 4, he's going to focus in on Abraham and kind of demonstrate how that Abraham was saved by faith not by works. But hope you got something out of it. Thank you for watching.